it's been over 12 years in the making and our boy from <laughs> the Iron Maiden camp is solo again. Bruce Dickinson, March 1st, is releasing the brand new one, The Mandrake Project. And we're lucky enough today to have the producer and guitarist of Bruce's solo band, Roy Z, with us. Roy, welcome back to Metal Mayhem ROC. How are you, buddy? Doing good, doing good. Thank you for asking. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. I'm up here in Rochester, New York. My partner tonight, uh, he's down in New Jersey. Goes by the name of Metal Walt. Walt, say hello to Roy. Roy, what's up, man? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I won't gonna go back in time and I'm gonna remind you, hopefully, of a memory you remember with me. It was on the uh Halford Crucible tour. They did, you guys did a bunch of shows in Japan. You came back and did two shows in Brooklyn. And we went, I was at the show. After the show, we went to Duff's, which was in New York City at the time, not in Brooklyn. And we were all there. We we partied really, really late. And one of my most memorable metals, uh, metal memories of my life, and you were in the pit with me, was all of us together singing Heaven and Hell around three in the morning. Tell me you remember that moment. Uh, I, I would be lying if I did. If I did tell you that I remember, I don't. But it sounds like typical me back then. <laughs> well, it was it was great. I'm telling you, man. I remember that was back when business cards were being handed out, and you and I exchanged yeah. business cards. And I'll never yeah. forget. You were like, "Yo, bro, if you're ever in L.A., man, just you give me a call. You come to the studio and hang." I probably yeah. have that business card somewhere. No, I I, re I remember you. I just don't remember the heaven and hell part. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, it was three in the morning, and it was 20 years ago. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. But uh, Roy, congratulations on uh, the new album and your contributions. You're a big part of this. So, um, listen, you have you and Bruce have a long history and a background. Um, you go back to the beginnings when you started collaborating on Balls to C Picasso in 1994. This is the first time you guys have been collaborating since uh, Tyranny of Souls in 05. But um, talk a little bit about the origins of this album. Like, um, was this in the making for a while? And, and how do you craft a vision around Bruce's vision? You know, he's all he's flying jet planes around the world. He's on tour all over the place with Maiden. How do you make this whole thing work and put it together? Well, uh, to, to, to answer the, first, the beginning of your question, um, this has been in the making for at least, uh, I mean, there's one song on there from that we did in 2002. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I would say that 80% uh, of the record was written in 2012. And then, uh, from what I understand, Maiden, we're going to take a break. Uh, I know that because uh, Dave Murray hit me up to do his solo record. <laughs> oh. And, uh, and uh, but yeah, no, we, we just started working on stuff. Bruce came over to my home and and we just started writing. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, things happened and all of a sudden, uh, one of the tunes that we had was uh, "If Eternity Should Fail," and uh, and then so that got picked up by 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 Maiden, uh, and um, and then they decided not to take off the time they were going to take off, and then uh, and then they went on tour, and they went on tour, and they went on tour, supporting that, and then. Um, we tried to get back. We got back together once again in 2018. Um, and then um, we had plans still to do stuff. And then uh, then, the, then we had that whole pandemic situation go down. And we were basically on lockdown. Um, after the lockdown, everybody got whatever they, you know, some people got shots. Some people didn't get the shots, whatever. Um, uh, but finally, the time was right for us to finish up and get her done. You know, I was just checking into this. Dave Murray never did a solo album. Whatever happened to Murray doing a solo album? Did he not do it because he couldn't I do it? I, I want to know. I, 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 I still want to do it. 
but we <laughs> we 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 agreed to work together. Uh, 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 oddly enough, um, I was lucky. I was blessed enough to play rock and Rio um, on my own. Um, as, as far as just being myself, not in a band. Mm-hmm. And uh, Maiden were playing rock and Rio, and Dave and I ended up uh, on a beach in Copacabana at like five, three, four, five, six, and. Like we stayed up all night just talking about, you know, doing his record, and it never happened. So, but hopefully, one day it will. For you, I hope it does. So, uh, well, you want to get into this? Yeah, you're, you're itching at the bit. Yeah. So, hey, Roy, like, um, you know, uh, reading the press notes, they call the Mandrake Project. They said it's not just an album, but a dark adult story of power abuse and struggle for identity set against the backdrop of scientific and occult genius. So I, I'm just curious, like you being the primary songwriter, I mean, you play bass and guitar in the album, but how do you work with Bruce? Like, how does he, cause he's a mastermind in so many ways. How does he take a vision of what he's thinking? Because it's obviously an important piece of work for him. He's not putting a solo album out every two or three years. How do you take his vision and put the music towards it and exchanging of ideas. Like how does all that work? How do you put, how do you realize a project such as this to the finish line? Well, it's funny that you use the word vision because uh, when I produce records, it's my job to make the artist's vision happen. And, uh, and then we just, when I work with Bruce, uh, you know, the creator gave us a chemistry that is just, it's like, it's like butter on toast. You know what I mean? We don't have to work so hard. We work hard. We work, don't get me wrong. We work, we work, work our butts off. But what I'm saying that the, 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 the way that we come together is very natural. And, um, and we also happen to have some, mutual influences that we're able to exchange um from musical musical themes um bands but also just the vibe and uh you know and uh you know uh, I I I, ju- I was just saying to somebody uh you know um we were talking about the new video and and I go, wow, man, um, the, the video is cool, this and that. And I go, yeah, it's total, you know, Hammer House of Horror. Like, there's not a lot of people that I know that are fans of Hammer House of Horror, but Bruce is, you know? And yeah, we'll, uh, so, yeah. No, I was just going to comment. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that video, but you, you mentioned the vision. You guys, you know, you you two finish each other's sentences. You you know, you're joined at the hip and like, you know, when we start going into the first track after Glove Ragnarok, that that was the debut song. It was the debut debut video. And uh, it's, you, you came out with a bang. Well, let's talk about that first opening track because it's a, um, you know, it is the video comes out with, I am the very soul. You do not know. It's a big, epic, uh, cinematic track. Personally, I, I love it. I think it's a throwback kind of song. It gets right there. The guitar is consistent, has a um, nice, clean, digestible sound. Let's get your views on um, uh, Ragnarok. Well, uh, oddly enough, the first two songs were the last songs that we wrote together. And I came up with my parts within a half half an hour of each other. So to me, they're like twins because Ragnarok and Many Doors to Hell were written within one hour from the musical standpoint. Uh, then Bruce heard him and he says, oh, he just started, you know, going off and writing his words and melodies and stuff. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I deal with the musical side and I leave the rest to Bruce. And I just try to create canvases for him to do his thing. So, Roy, like on a song like Ragnarok, though, like you look at the video, right? And it's not even a video. It's like a mini film. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's words up on the screen that present like 
what's to happen? I must create a system or be enslaved by another man. You know, then this character that's created, Necropolis comes in, there's a spirit gathering, this coin gets flipped, which then you look and you're like, oh shit, that's the album cover art. You know, he crosses the ocean, things are blowing up, there's mass men, he's on a table. Then he comes out of this post-dream state and he's like, ah, right. he tells his wife, I've seen the Mandrake Project. Like, it's just amazing to me. Like, did you have a part in this whole, like, creation of the character Dr. Necropolis and the comic series and Tony Lee, the British writer coming in, like were you around for all that as, as the vision is being crafted? Um, initially, yes, I wasn't involved. I was just listening to what Bruce, um, like back in 2012, Bruce's vision of these, these characters that he had in mind back then. And so I would try to create canvases for him to express himself and create what he was creating, which is ultimately this Mandrake project. Because it's it's amazing, right? Because like that's a big responsibility that you have to take on an ownership because of a, of the complexities of a song like that or Rain on the Graves, where he has a vision of it's not just the music. It's a storyline too, but um, then you get into let's say the second track, "Many Doors to Hell," right? Believe the tales I tell. Many many doors open to hell, but like talk about like the music in that one. Like that one, it's it's like a catchy '80s vibe with the guitars and the drums. It's melodic. It's radio friendly. You got a little Hammond organ touch in there, and then Bruce comes in and he sings his ass off like on the bridge and the chorus. Got a killer trippy yeah. guitar solo, but. Talk about that track because you talk about contrast from songs one, two, and three. It's all over the place. Well, you know, that's why it's a solo record. I mean, and uh, it's it's Bruce's solo record. Uh, I just bring in the music, most of it, not all of it, but most of it. And I, I just try to do things that I know that he's going to like and that, that I know and just give him that canvas for him to do his magic, you know? And he comes up with all these concepts and ideas. And I just think to myself, you know, like, I mean, this is this is awesome, you know, like to have, to be able to work with someone that um, comes up with not just words and melodies, but a whole, you know, it's like a, it's like a docu-series almost. It's almost like its own Netflix going on. And, um, and so uh, all I have to say is that uh, I'm blessed enough to, you know, to have him as a sounding board as well. And he has me as a sounding board. But most of the time, he just goes and, and he's, he's just happy, you know. And that's, that's, that's my gig is to make him happy. You know, when I listen to the, a song like Many Doors to Hell, you know, I've been listening yeah. to Bruce. I've been a fan for 40 plus years, like we all yeah. have, and following yeah. the career, the solos. But, you know, throughout this album, I I feel and I hear, I don't want to say repeat the way he sings other songs, but I hear a little bit of, in the part of that song when he says, Tales of Destination, has a little bit of that out on the lonely planet from Maiden on there and almost sings it like the same way. And, it's just uh, it's just Bruce isms, if you will. And, you know, I just I really enjoy the way he's singing on this. It's like it's a, a collaboration of his whole career. And it just I've been a fan so long that I just hear little parts here and there. Do you hear any of that when is a are you able to put your fan hat on and go, oh, it's like Bruce 30 years ago or this is a new way of him singing because he has matured on a lot of these tracks. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. Uh, when we started recording this record, uh, Bruce didn't realize he had a golf ball sized tumor in his mm -hmm. in his throat. And uh, once he, you know, and he was singing, he was singing fantastic then, and uh, and, and 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 you know, unbeknownst to us at that time that he had that. Um, you know, um, we were doing just fine. And then, uh, then he had it removed, 
then I heard the ditch, the difference. He actually got better because he didn't have this thing obstructing his throat. Yeah. And uh, but I, I, one uh, one thing I'm there's two things I'm really proud of about this record. Um, I'm proud number one that um, I got to play bass and I didn't use a I didn't use a pick. It was all fingers. Um, and the, but the main thing that I'm proud of is Bruce and his vocals, because we didn't have to use not one drop of auto tune for him. He he worked for every single freaking word, and every single line, and every note. He worked his butt off for it, and that's what I'm talking about. His work ethic. Was there points where you made the decision like, yeah, we could possibly touch it up or did you leave it in for the sincerity and the authenticness of it? Because there's one song later on in there in my notes where it almost sounds like, I don't want to say he's straining, but I didn't, I didn't realize if that was the way he was singing it or it's the limitations of a 60 year old singer that's overcome cancer. Well, it depends on the song, really, that you're yeah. talking about. I, I don't know what song. Yeah, when we get there. About. But I guess the real yeah, question the thing was... Is, is that to me, there's no... there's To me, to be honest with you, to me, it all sounds great. Mm -hmm. It sounds fantastic on the whole record. It, and, it, and it wouldn't have seen, seen the light of day if, if, if we didn't think so. No, it wasn't a slight on them. It was just, you know, just my interpretation, because I have listened to this a lot. and taken in consideration that he did go through that. But when you mentioned that you didn't touch anything up and you kept the auto tune out of it, it just sparked a, a little comment in my head, but it wasn't a slight on Bruce because Christ, you're right. He sounds fantastic. It's he's on his, his a game, a plus game. So exactly, that's all. exactly that, that my whole thing is this, is that, uh, um, um, we, we, uh, we have our system on how we work. And, and, you know, we, we're, we're, uh, we're dotting the I's and we're crossing the T's as best we can. And I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, we're all humans. And, um, but we wanted to give it that angst of, 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 of trying our best and not cheat. So, hey, Roy, on the on the Rain on the Graves video, uh, wanted to get into track number three. I mean, number one, it's it's a killer song because the, the bluesy riff supports the lyrics and the storyline. Big, catchy chorus. But I was curious, um, it, is this the first time you've been presented in such a way in a video like a film like and, and for our viewers, if you haven't seen it, you got to check it out because, you know, Bruce is out there playing the role of a preacher talking to the devil guys popping out of the grave and then all of a sudden like the touring band comes out and it looks like you guys are in like steampunk clothes um it was really really cool and then at the end he kind of visits the gravestone of william blake this poet so talk about making that video and being in the video well um you know being in the video i just had to uh you know um the, the the director was really cool and i just said hey what do you need me to do and so i just tried to pick his brain and uh and he obviously he had a storyboard with bruce and and they had written this stuff together and i just tried to you know just mold myself into that it was a long and cold day i'll tell you that we're in where was that shot was that out in la no, that was in, in Cornwall, down in uh, southern England. And it was cold, and it, and it was perfect. Uh, and then that, it, and we knew it was perfect when it started raining outside. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, I, I, to be honest with you, uh, I had my fun of trying to be an actor in that thing. And uh, there's some scenes that nobody will ever see, but some funny stuff. We had a, we had a good time, you know, because I I I had a suit on that didn't fit me, and uh, and they put all this dust on me, and I just like I don't know, 
It was a trip. It was just to see all this magic go down. It was cool. But it was cold. I'm not going to lie. It was cold. My feet right. are cold now. Just think about it. Just thinking about it. <laughs> Roy, we have a YouTube uh, viewer. He has a couple questions relating to the video. The first one is uh, the upright bass in the video. Not usually seen in metal for sure. Just a comment. And then this is from Bob Olson of Rochester, New York, who's a guitar player. Gets a little deep. He says, your guitar in the rain on the graves appears to be a JG. Italian or Swedish, looks like a take on the old Guild Starfire with a unique tremolo. Did you have a part in the design? Pickups look to be humbuckers. Are they a signature model? Uh, well, let's go to the bass. Um, the bass was was a, a, a prop uh, uh, to to signify um, just to like kind of give us. Uh, a, a look of, I don't know, uh, of a time period. And so, and same with the guitar, to be honest. It, and it was an Italian guitar and it, and it was hired. Uh, I, I, it was just hired for the, this was the vision of, of, of uh, the director and Bruce. Uh, so uh, to be honest with you, uh, I had no idea that I was going to be playing a guitar like that or that Tanya was gonna be playing a bass like that. We just showed up and they said, this is what you're working with. Oh. Well, uh, Bob, he's a big guitarist and the other questions he had really went deep, but it looks like, like you said, it was just a prop. All right, Bob, there's yeah. your answer. It's just a prop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Walt. So uh, the track Resurrection Man, um, Eternity has failed again. So that that theme and that line is placed in that song. I caught that pretty well. But Roy, this song's freaking really cool in a weird way because it's like this country western. It's got a skip and a trop to it. I can almost imagine like a horse coming down the street on it. And it's got this cool boom, 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 one chord bass line. And then mid song, you're thinking, all right, this is going to be like a short little country song. And then all of a sudden, this like Sabbath heavy riff comes in, totally vintage sounding, totally killer. And then you go back to the country feel. So I love that one. Talk about that one. Well, I mean, uh, again, that's Bruce playing the uh, the Dick Dale bit. He's like, can you get a Dick Dale sound? And I'm like, yeah. So I said, Pl just play and let me dial in this sound. And um, uh, and so I'm dialing in the sound, and he's playing the riff, and I like, and I hit record behind his. He didn't know I was hitting record. I just said just, and then that was it. And that's Bruce playing that bit, the down 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 down, you know. But it just it just kind of like we were going for that, you know, Dick Dale meets you know, Ennio Maricone, you know that 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 uh, spaghetti western vibe, you know. And then, um, and then the middle bit, uh, I just said, "What about something like this?" And then we started putting that down, you know. And so it was just again a nat natural progression of things. So uh, I, I don't know what else to elaborate on it other than I, I really like that middle bit, and I think people are going to headbang to that if we play it live, you know. Hopefully oh my god, because it because it is. It's like two different. It's like black and white contrasts. And there's another truck later, a track later on there. You have a little bit of that too, but I think that one stands out. Fingers in the wound has one of my favorite lyrics of the whole album. Take a pearl from the oyster and feed it to the swine. I mean, I don't even know what that means, but it just sounds pretty badass. But um, love the key, the little keys in the piano, the acoustic guitar. That one like has the music subtly and it allows Bruce to come in the forefront and kind of deliver the story line. And again, this is another one where all of a sudden you're shifting into this like Arabic Middle Eastern breakout jam. And it's not just like music. It's like a fucking killer jam. So comment on that one. Well, um, uh, uh, this was a tune that Bruce had. And uh, um, it, it, uh, I'm not ashamed to say it almost didn't make the record. And I said, no, this has to make a record. This is a really good song. and. Uh, 
there's a line in there that goes boom, 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 the very Arabic stuff. And then I came up with that. And then we just built around it, to be honest with you. Um, and, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, F Fingers in the Womb was an important song because um, it showed that we were, we did, I didn't give up on the song. And after I didn't give up, then Bruce didn't give up and we built it up and we made it happen. And I'm really proud of that. You know, Roy, uh, you got to address um, the, the internity as fail, the connection to the maiden. How did this come about your version or the solo versions? Uh, very similar, but shorter. Quickly uh, lay out the landscape of how it was on a Maiden album, then made it onto here. Well, the, uh, we we did the original, mm -hmm. and that was our, we had our demo, and uh, which I don't, we don't really do demos anymore. We just add on to our demo, so it's just a we laid down the foundation for that tune, and then uh, Bruce played it for the office, and. Uh, and I guess Steve heard it, and they decided to put it on, 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 on the Maiden record. To be honest, and uh, but then Bruce said, um, "I still want to release the original version," and so we worked on that and finished it up. And it's that simple. So um, it came out in a in a different sequence that it was supposed to come out in, but our version was the first version. Yeah, I did a little, uh, I was playing both of them just to compare it. And there's some differences. There's a different chorus and just the uh, assembly of the song. It's a little different on the uh, Mandrake Project version, but a uh, great track nonetheless. But the next track, Mistress of Mercy, that's my favorite song. That's the, I think the, it's just a, a killer song. The riff, um, Killer bass, the guitar intro is second to none, and Bruce's vocals is uh, excellent. Great tune to do my spinning exercises. Uh, discuss this song because it's just uh, it's contagious. It's addicting that chorus. Yeah, uh, again, um, it was just uh, hanging out with Bruce, and he picked up my guitar and he said. I have this, he goes, I have a riff. And I go, cool, let, let me hear it. And so he he showed me the riff. And then um, then we were just, you know, uh, messing about and work. And then we started just working on that song. You know, I, I programmed the beat. I remember that, I programmed the beat. And uh, I mean, we didn't use the, 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 we didn't use that drum machine bit and because it's real all real drums except for uh sonata but to, no i mean it was just something organic bruce had an idea and we ran with it and we put it together you know and uh and we said hey let's go a little proggy in the middle so we go a little proggy in the middle and and then i'm like you know uh i was uh it was around that when i did that solo it was around the time that uh, jeff beck died i said I want to give like a little nod to Jeff Beck in here. Mm -hmm. So that's about it, really. You know, it was just something that, that uh, Bruce had an idea and we just ran with it. Well, hey, Roy, one observation with uh, every song on this album is every song, the chorus is overly melodic. It's just an observation I had. And I think it's well done and I appreciate it. Well, I don't know what to say other than that's Bruce and I, you know, we're not, we're not crooks. We like hooks. There you go. I like that. <laughs> well, you, you, you ran with it and you ran far. It's, it's my favorite track. And Hey, any chance it's going to be in the live set? Not that, you know, I'm not going to be over in Europe. I, 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 soon. Have, I, I honestly, I have no idea. Uh, I, I, you know, Bruce is formulating everything for us. And uh, his vision is now going from uh, from vinyl to the stage, if you know what I mean. And uh, so we're just all excited and waiting and 
you know, and we're excited to share what we're going to share on, on stage. Like I said, I wish I'd be able to see it, but in any case, uh, the next track, uh, Faces in the Mirror, a more softer song, piano, acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, what's what's the vibe behind this one? Well, that was that was completely written by Bruce on his own, and and he does it. He he's the one playing the acoustic guitar solo. Okay, and that's a first. So he actually plays. He's actually on the record quite a bit, and uh, but on that song, that was he wrote that song. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I thought he wrote it about me, you know. <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh man, he's he's trying to get he's trying to get to me through a song. <laughs> like, I don't know, it, it kind of felt like it anyway. But I I love I just really love that. I, I don't want to say I made him, but I persuaded him to to, to play that solo. And uh, I'm stoked about it. Well, some of my notes, the picking in the bass, definitely in the pocket. So you definitely, uh, I'm not a musician, but you, you, no, you left I a mark on me. It was, all, it was all fingers. No, there was no picking. It was all fingers. Well, it was, I was but the point I'm trying to make is, as a non-musician, you, you struck a chord mm -hmm. with me, and that uh, the bass and the guitar was definitely uh, left a left a mark for me. Oh, that well, that's 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 good to know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's bits in Bruce's solo that I actually double, and that's where my geezer my geezer Butler influence comes in because geezer does that for Tony. He just reinforces stuff, you know, and uh, for 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 Tony and uh so you know it, it, it's it's no uh it, it's no uh, uh mystery that uh uh that that I'm a big sabbath head you know I'm really into sabbath so you know so I I I I tried my best to back Bruce on that one the um the other thing I like about the storyline about face in the mirror is it seems like in Bruce's vision of his story this is where necropolis he starts you know, he hits his hardest point and the decline is coming through the story of this song, because then as you get into the last two tracks, Shadow of the Gods and then Sonata, I mean, mm -hmm. Roy, these are both epic tracks. They're long ones in duration, but we'll, let's go with Shadow of the Gods first. I mean, it clocks in at seven minutes, um, very theatrical, lots of piano. And again, Bruce is in the spotlight there for a good portion of the song telling the story. And then it gets up to about that four minute mark. And then, bam, you go into that Sabbath style again. And maybe this is something that I've never really heard Bruce as it's getting faster and heavier. He just gets into like some really heavy singing there. Um, and then this amazing, great melodic close. So it's really a quite a body of work. Impressive. And I love Bruce's singing on that comment on that track. Well, that track was originally written back in. 1999 2000 around there I, I i wrote the music and i had the title and it was written for what was going to be the trinity project with rob halford and and we were going to have ronnie dio and bruce that was the original supposed to be the original lineup for that and uh so that song the middle bit there was actually written for rob halford to sing with Bruce. Hmm. So that's why you get that black country style in there. I call it, you know, the Birmingham sound. And, uh, you know, and uh, so that's what happened there. So I, we're just writing some, just we were just trying to come up with something uh, for that project, to be honest. And, uh, you know, uh, we've been sprinkling all these songs that we wrote for that project over the last few records. And uh, that one uh, would explain itself to you a little bit better. So Bruce is doing his best Rob Halford in the middle there, you know. And uh, it's cool because they're friends. And we've done, we've done music before, the one you love to hate. And, uh, and uh, so that was, that was the intention of that when we wrote that. 
Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate you sharing that context to that because that that just frames up that song even more, man. But awesome job on that one. So yeah, Sonata, cheers. Immortal Beloved, yeah. this closes the album. Nine minutes and 51 seconds, right? Save me now, save me now, save me from my pain. Long and epic journey to close. But Roy, I want to give you props here because to me, you do a lot of shredding and great playing on this album, but this is the one that I appreciate most about your playing because it's atmospheric, it's moody, it's trippy, it's mysterious, it's very somber song. But yeah, when you you hear this one, like I, I had it in the car and then I had it on, on in my computer, it doesn't do it justice unless you have the earbuds on. And it's like a song mm -hmm. to be heard with your earbuds in and your eyes closed because towards the back end of the track, um, there's some amazing subtle guitar work that just hides in the shadow of the song. Um, I just love it. And it just shows how adept you are at your craft. So here's your chance to to talk about this song and how it closes out the album for you. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, when I came up with that idea, I was inspired by the movie uh, Immortal Beloved with Gary Oldman, where he's playing Beethoven. And uh, and it's one of my favorite all time favorite movies of all time, uh, and and so uh, I was going through my um, this is before vinyl was hip. This is this was written in about I'd say about two thousand and one, two thousand and two, around there, and um, um, and I was going through my. Anyway, I was going through my vinyl collection and, and I saw this old classical thing. And then I'm like, oh, wow, Beethoven, cool. So I put it on the turntable and I'm just listening to it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a loop out of this, of, of Moonlight Sonata. Um, and I'm just going to jam over it. And so I put, the, I, 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 I don't know, it, and it was very primitive back then. Um, and uh, next thing you know, uh, it was it was originally done on an ADAT. I don't know if people remember ADATs, but it was like a videotape that you put in, and you had eight tracks, and that was it. So I put in, I I, I started the tune with the beat um, on on the drum machine, um, and uh, and then I, and then I looped very primitively i had to push the button every time that i wanted it to loop the moonlight sonata by hand manually and that took me forever to do uh but then i, I put this atmospheric guitar on it and then um i wasn't going to do anything to it and uh so one one, one day uh at the, at the old studio we used to work out of in burbank called uh, silver cloud that's not there anymore um I was working on it before, you know, before work, before working with Bruce and Bruce walks in and he heard, he's like, Z, what, what, what the F is that? And I'm like, well, it's uh, something I'm working on. And he's like, go on, let me hear it. And then he heard it. And next thing you know, he's writing words and, and we had a tune, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and then later on, he came up with a hook, Save Me Now. And we just thought, man, this is cool. This is a cool track. And it and it really, um, I think it's our mutually might be one of our favorite tracks on the record for between him and myself as writers, because it was a complete accident. It's, it's a jam, really. Oh, my notes has just epic, just excellent clothes, hey. just epic. And, and, and Walt's yeah. right. You need, you need the earbuds. You, you need yeah. not to be distracted and just, um, yeah. is, is excellent. Um, well, you know, you, you touched on, you really don't have any input on the set list. Do you have any input on possibly this tour coming to the States at any point? Again, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, uh, um, again, I'm, you know, uh, I'm open for anything myself personally, but it's not just up to me. So if the team wants to do that and we come to America, that would be lovely. I think it would be great. 
to be honest with you. Um, it's been a long time since we've played the States. And I think people would really uh, enjoy it. So let's see what happens. Fingers crossed. Because you, oh. you are doing a big tour of South America and Europe. You're hitting some of the festivals. You know, the problem yeah. becomes then mating comes back to the States in the fall again, right? And so you're probably talking sometime next year, 2025, by hitting it. But, um, I mean, I know it's hard to say, but uh, did you and Bruce, have you talked about, like, maybe not – exact set list but just how much of this new album will be showcased and will you go back and and even do stuff off of like tattooed millionaire will you avoid the mating catalog altogether i mean that's a dream solo tour to me would be do 15 to 20 songs of just bruce solo mm -hmm. uh well i uh without saying too much i uh, i could say that uh you know at this point anything's possible um and let's just see what happens Let's see what let's see what 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 the captain tells us what he wants to do. <laughs> Speaking of being a captain, I'm curious: Have you ever been up in the air with the captain? Has he ever said, "All right, Roy, I'll come pick you up. I'll be in L.A." Oh yeah, I mean, especially the early days of Bruce flying. I was his I was his co I was his co pilot, if you want to call me that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a pilot at all or anything, but uh, in the early days. We'd be up in these little planes that were like flying Volkswagens, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, I'd have maps and I'd have my headset on. And and uh, all I could say is uh, I, I used to be afraid of flying, but not anymore. Because if I was going to die, I would have been dead already. <laughs> well, you would have died with your Bruce boots on if you did. So that's, that's <laughs> well. You know, I, you know, I, I'm from the same, you know, I'm from the same hometown as Richie Valens. And I kept thinking to myself, OK, I've got but I got my buddy Holly right here. So let's see what happens, you know. It, but but no, it was it was it was really adventurous and fun. The adrenaline of being up there and and and, and being with him and, you know, and, and just, you know, he, he 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 really worked his butt off to become a commercial pilot. And I was I was really proud of him because there was not a moment that he didn't have his books out just going for it, you know, and to achieve what he achieved is, is just tremendous. But it's just one chapter in his book, to be honest with you. But uh, I used to go flying with him all the time. There was a there was one time where he. Uh, and, and I think it was called I think the air the air. I think the airport was called Maidenhead in <laughs> in England, and he would and he would practice uh, taking off and landing. So we would do that for like an hour. Wow. <laughs> He's doing reps. It's practice. It's a flying practice. Y you know, yeah. uh, Roy, I just want to mention something on a personal level and um, out of your respect to yourself. Eight two oh six. I got sober. And I wouldn't be where I am today without, you know, the help of friends, family, and, you know, whatever spiritual uh, guidance you use. Uh, congratulations, my friend. It's a, it's a hard path. And obviously you've achieved professional success and I hope personal success along the way. Congratulations. I, I appreciate that. Well, you know, um, it's like, um, you know, it, it to be honest with you, it's 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 not easy, but but um, the love that you that you gain throughout the journey is the the love that is essential and it's true, you know. And to work with a guy like Rob, who's been sober now, I think going on forty years or so. It's the other day. Um, yep. Uh, uh, thirty. I think it's what is it, thirty eight or thirty nine years? I think I saw thirty eight years. It was the other day. Yeah. Said. Well, when we did that, when we did that album, um, uh, made made of metal. There's a song on there called Twenty Five Years, and that was his twenty five years when we did that. That's a deep journey. His story is, his testimony is is really deep. 
And then we have to start an interview with uh, my excellent co-host going back to 20 years ago with some crazy night of you guys cocktailing. But, you know, it, we were just... Hey, man. He's just having hey, fun. You know, no, hey, man. You know, it, it's, all been a, it's all been a cool journey. But uh, now I just want to enjoy the rest of this thing called life. And I joke been- and I tell people, I said, hey, I retired an all-pro. You know, like when athletes retire, they think they're high school coach. And well, we do the same thing. No one's going to do it any better. And we drop the mic. So one last time, congratulations, Roy. That's uh, all right. Cheers. That's good stuff. So So, Roy, we appreciate your time today. Um, This has been a very insightful and really, you've really painted the color about the Mandrake project. Thank you so much. We wish you best of luck. On the success, the success of the album and the tour to come, you never know where we might show up and see you. We'll hit you up. One last question for you. On a personal level or a professional level, outside of the Bruce Dickinson camp, what do you got going on musically? Anything else? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm, I'm developing um, my own outlet for my band, Tribe of Gypsies, and for my own music because I'm not going to go through the, the contemporary outlets. In other, in other words, I'm not going to let Spotify rape me. Ain't happening. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I'm going to pull all my stuff off of YouTube and I'm going to have my own outlet. Sounds good. Well, uh, Roy, the album comes out on March 1st on BMG. Um, tell us where we can get all the information on your, your background, your history, everything on the Mandrake Project and Bruce. What are the socials? Um, well, you start, start off with the, the Mandrake project, um, uh, hashtag, um, and then of, of course, Bruce hashtag Bruce Dickinson HQ on Instagram. Um, I'm on Instagram, Roy Z Ramirez. Um, I don't do a lot of socials, but if you want to know more about me, you can look up, look, look me up on Wikipedia. You know, um, and um, that's it. Okay. All right. Well, listeners, of course, have all this vision of getting your product out there. Send to us. We could put links on our website where whatever be because we're all in this together. And anything we could do here at Metal Mayhem RLC, we're we're here for you, man. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Roy Z, Mandrake Project, March 1st again. Reach out to him. Listeners, just want to remind you, get up to our website, MetalMayhemROC.com. Join our community by signing up for the newsletter. For my co-host, Metal Walt, and our fantastic metal friend, Roy Z, I'm the Vernomatic. We will talk with you soon. Keep it heavy. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at MetalMayhemROC.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.